headed toward the right kind of weather out there, but hadn't quite made up its mind yet, has it? Amen, brother. Okay, he's got the power this morning. Power, power. All right. Well, I got to go to that funeral preacher was talking about yesterday. Praise the Lord. Yes, sir. And, really. uh, that was, uh, I think Brother Mike and I were talking about that last night back and forth. And that been to some good funerals. I think that was the best one, Brother Mike. No doubt. And uh, just a, a life lived for the Lord, you know, um, Caracol family has touched a lot of lives in their ministry. Yes, sir. And no doubt that's why a lot of what happened yesterday, God just honored that, you know, because so many people have uh, been, been enriched by what they did. And uh, Sister Lou was just an example of a good godly woman, an example that uh, all of us could follow. And uh, boy, so many things to say about her life and what she did. Most of you knew them. Uh, those of you that haven't been coming here that long and maybe had not been around them that long, uh, if you've been to camp meeting at all, Brother Bob Carrico is the one that leads our singing in the camp meeting. And uh, it's his wife, Sister Lou, that just passed away. And um, I guess they've been coming here, I, I think, just about the entire time I've been coming to Good Shepherd. Brother Maynard, is, is the Carrico's, Brother Maynard, have the Carrico's been coming here as long as you've been coming, Brother? I don't know if he can he can't hear you from here. Me. Uh, because Brother Maynard was coming not long before uh, I did. And uh, I think they've been here that entire time. And they've been a blessing to us. Brother Gary, you, I know you've been around a long time, brother, and, and several of you in here this morning. I've uh, been coming for a long time. But anyway, um, their family uh, it, it just made a, an impression on me. And I, I know uh, Brother Bobby, one time we went down to Dixie Highway and uh, trying to think whose church we were at. Um, Brother Hecock. <laughs> and boy, Brother Bobby preached on everything but the gravel in the parking <laughs> lot. And I thought toward the end of that service, Chris, I thought, man, half these people probably had ever been under any kind of preaching like that. They're going to get up and fly out of here, you know, as soon as the back door opened up. I think five or six people got saved during that service. Amen. Amen. And the uh, only other person I know like that that I've met in my lifetime, John, you've been around a lot more preachers than I have. Uh, I've been around quite a few because of the camp meeting and different things that happen around here in places we've been. And Brother Freddie Spry's like that. Man, I mean, he can preach. Uh, he's got a way about him, like with men in, in prison. Uh, he has results that most people don't see. He's got, God's given him a way of communicating with people, and they receive it. You know, even though it might seem, man, it might seem brazen, it might seem harsh coming from him, he can still get it across in a way that they swallow it. And God works in it, does a, does a work in their hearts. And, and the Caracol family's a lot like that. They've been a blessing over the years. You all probably heard Brother Aaron uh, sing here, his son, and Danita. They've been here at the church. And uh, Becca Carico, his, his daughter, done a lot of singing here. And uh, just we, we were blessed by being there. I tell you, it was, it was an encouragement to mm. see what God would do yes, with sir. a life dedicated for him. Yes, sir. And, uh, and Mike and I were talking about last night, you know, we've still got opportunity. We're still on this side of the grave. We've still got some time, Chris, to do something for the Lord. Yes. And I believe God is doing and will continue to do through us things to bring honor and glory to his name until we leave here, if, if we dedicate our lives to him. And uh, that's, that's, I know, what we all want to do this morning. And with that thought in mind, uh, something I've been thinking about the last week or two, don't know the exact time frame, but something the Lord's had on my heart is habits, ha habits, and uh, having godly habits. And, uh, you know, I, I, habits kind of carry you through uh, times when you're maybe, preacher talks a lot about the flesh and the spirit. Uh, there's sometimes that your, your body, your flesh, doesn't feel like doing what your spirit wants it to do, right? Anybody ever encountered that? Chris ever get home on a bad day from trackside, had a bad bunch of customers, something go wrong, and your body feel like staying at the house, but your spirit wants to come. Uh, I think all of us have encountered times like that. Uh, brother Dave, I know you've had a couple rough weeks, brother. I heard, I heard what happened with your truck. And you know, there's times you get discouraged in life. There's, there's times that things don't go right. 
and you're not rejoicing like we were yesterday. Now they had both emotions because you got one side of you, the fleshly side of you, that's wanting your mom back, wanting your wife back, wanting your friend back, and just wanting to see them and sit down and converse with them. And then there's the spiritual side where you're like, you're praising God that they're with the Lord and you can't wait to get there. So that's kind of got some duality about it. And, uh, and you and I are like that sometimes. But boy, I, I found uh, sometimes it's just good habits that'll carry you through times that you're, you're, maybe your body is not willing to go, you know. Uh, it, it's habits sometimes that will help you get up in the morning each day and read your Bible every day of your life. Because you don't always, do everybody just roll out of bed uh, feeling like a super saint every day. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you roll out and you want to roll back in, right? You think, I don't even want to get out of bed. And uh, it just, you don't always feel 100% spiritual like you want to, right? You just don't always feel good. And uh, habits, a lot of times, will carry us through those times. And uh, I heard a man say this this past week, uh, he said, you know, the, the people that I've seen that really uh, turn out to be something great in their lives or whatever realm, it doesn't really matter what it is, it could be the church realm, it could be outside the church, he said, are people that, uh, he said, they consistently do the right thing whether they feel like it or not. It's they just wake up each day and they do the right thing, you know, and they do it no matter what the season is, uh, no matter how they feel. And none of us are perfect, you know. We're not going to be knocking it out of the ballpark every day. But boy, habits, good habits will help carry you a long way on those days that things aren't quite like you'd like them to be. And we, we live in a fleshly body, right? We live in a fallen world. We're fallen people ourselves. We're sinners saved by grace. And we're going to have off days. And I'm telling you, I think you all know as well as I do, some of you know better than I do, that good habits will carry you through some of those tough days. So uh, just, just want to think about that a little bit. You ever heard the, the, that old saying, you can't teach an old dog new tricks? Anybody ever heard that? Oh, yeah. <clears throat> ever felt like that's true in your own life? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I am, Frank Chris. I feel like that. When I first started to work where I'm working now, I had to learn a lot of new things for the day. I mean, a lot of new things. And some of them fairly complex. And I didn't know if my 40-something-year-old mind would be able to learn. Like, I really didn't. I mean, I had a question in my mind. I was like, God, I don't know if I can learn this. Right. I don't know if I have the ability. Right. And, uh, but thank God you can. And uh, so, anyway, with that thought in mind, we'll go to the Lord in prayer. We'll ask him to bless what we're doing, and we'll get into our lesson this morning. Father, thank you, dear God, for this good day. And uh, Lord, again, for all your people who come out to your house this morning, Lord, we come to hear from you. And uh, God, we pray and ask that you do a work in our hearts this morning, God, that would uh, last, Lord, during this life that we have here on this earth, and help us get through this life, dear Lord, and uh, help us maybe to have some victory in, uh, on some days that maybe we ordinarily wouldn't. God, I pray that uh, you'd help this uh, message get across in any way you'd have it delivered, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, there's something science has learned about. You know, they're always behind the Bible. The Bible's always declared things since the foundation of the world that we're just now finding out about, but none of it's any surprise to God, right? Mm -hmm. The Bible says the secret things belong to the Lord. Some things we'll never know about, Brother Day. Uh, but the wisdom of man, the Bible says, is foolishness with God. So when we think we found some prized possession, something that, that really is... Uh, extraordinary. God knew about it all along. He's not surprised, but he reveals his will and reveals knowledge sometimes a little bit over time. You know, he kind of measures it out as he sees that we need it. And one of the things that we found out about in science, again, God knew about it all along. Have y'all ever heard the term neuroplasticity? Anybody ever heard that on TV or radio or any of that kind of stuff? Uh, what that is, is that your brain has the ability, they've discovered, again, God knew, uh, that your brain can make new pathways. It can forge new pathways in your mind. Uh, so the fact of the matter is that you can teach an old dog new tricks, right? But it comes a certain way, you know, it has to come a certain way. So, uh, but your, your mind can develop totally new pathways for information to travel that it ever had before but it has to be trained in a certain way. And what they found out is in a matter of about 66 days of doing the same thing, the same activity, 66 days, it's gonna take some effort, 
right? Have to put some effort into that. But after 66 days of doing the same thing, it becomes habitual, Mike. Yep. It becomes a habit. And you don't have to put so much effort into it. It just kind of comes naturally. Now, I'll be honest with you. I used to think, I don't think anymore, Chris, the same way I used to on some things that, that works change for me. Life experiences, as you experience things in life, they teach you things, right? Mm -hmm. For all of us. Um, I didn't understand when I was a young man uh, why my mom left my dad. I couldn't figure that out. I couldn't make sense of that, Chris, in my mind. But I wasn't an adult. I hadn't been in a marriage. I hadn't understood uh, some things that you grow to understand when you get a little bit older. And as I got older, Brother Mike, I knew it wasn't the right thing that she did, but I understood why she did what she did. It started to make more sense. You know, right. just things you things change through life. And, and, I, and I knew that that was kind of a traumatic point in my life. You know, we all had certain things, deaths, diff different things that happened that, that changed the course of our life. That changed mine. I didn't understand it, but I understood it as I got older. And, I, and I've understood some of these things as I've gotten older. Like I said, I experienced that starting a new job, really, Gary. I didn't think I could memorize anything new like that, but come to find out I could. So they give you some hope. If you got some, some years under your belt, I, I don't know if you've had to change uh, drastically, you know, but it can happen. By God, it, it can happen. And uh, we have the ability to be able to change. God's given our minds that, that ability, and we can develop new habits. Thank God we can. I think probably nothing I know of changes, changes a man or a woman or a young person like the new birth. I mean, talk about changing some habits. Uh, you know, in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter number 5 and verse number 17, I just want to quote it exactly because I might miss a couple words. If any man be in Christ, is a new creature. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. You know, when we get saved, we see life through a new lens. You know, and as you grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord, if you're faithful again, developing a good habit, if you develop a habit of reading your Bible every day, you'll begin to see life in a different way. You'll you'll see certain things that you do that are either maybe pleasing, and you want to do more of that to the Lord. Or you'll see things that are displeasing to the Lord, and you think, man, that needs to go. Yeah, that's got to go. God's not pleased with that. I'm going to get in trouble if I continue to do such and such, or say this, or do that, or go there, or whatever the case may be. Um, but we're talking about talking about developing uh, those new habits like that. Uh, God's able to, to take things that we used to do uh, and maybe move that aside and replace it with some new habits. Yeah. Uh, that we can do for his glory, Brother Mike. And I, I think sometimes we kind of, I've experienced that in midlife. I think I've started to experience that and see some of that. You ever hear people talk about the midlife crisis? Oh, yeah. Brother Gary, you think it's real? Yes. I do too. I do too. And I heard somebody explain that this past week. They said, you know, for a lot of your life, young people, you are going through this right now, Sam, Noah, Josh, some of you guys. Hannah, you back there for a lot of your life, you're looking up toward everything. You got all your goals before you. You're thinking, man, one day, uh, and Hannah, you've experienced some of this, but one day I'll be married, someday I'll have a house, someday I'll have this and that. And you're looking toward building your family, building your life. And uh, but when you get to midlife, sometimes you've, you've gotten some of those things, and now you're looking down at life. You're looking toward death, you know, and you're thinking, I've only got so many more years to live, you know? And it's it's a different look. And then all of a sudden you feel like, well, if I'm gonna do something, I better be getting it done now. I think a lot of people in marriage say, man, this isn't working out. You know, I don't wanna live the rest of my life with this person anymore. If I'm gonna be happy, I've only got so much time to do it. I need to get out of this relationship and get on to a new one. You know, that, that happens a lot to people that period of life. Uh, you see men go out and buy irrational things Brother Gary, they'll go out and buy a new Corvette, you know. Didn't really have the money for a Corvette, but he's always wanted one. He thought, well, if I'm going to have time to get one and if I'm going to be uh, not senile enough to be able to drive it, you know, and, and not drive it through all the red lights, I better be getting it now, you know. So they go out and they buy things that they don't need. And sometimes women will do irrational things, you know, because it's a different view. You're seeing life in a different way that you didn't see it before. Uh, but having experienced that, going through the Brother Gary, 
I want to develop some good habits for the Lord. I hope I don't go out and do a bunch of irrational things, you know. I don't need a Corvette, but I need to live <laughs> for the Lord, you know. And I need to do some things for his glory and honor. And uh, and I want to do that, as sure as I'm, I'm sure, just like you all do. And uh, you could either look at it as downhill or uphill, whichever way you want to make the view, Mike, Brother Wright. It could be, it could be the best years. Brother Gary's encouraged me there. Uh, Cause I kind of felt like after I got past forty, everything was just downhill. He was like, "Oh no, 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 brother! The, your best years are before you now." And then you can look at it, and they can be your best years, brother Gary. They can be our best years, or we can just sit in the corner somewhere and let them wind away and die. You know, one or the other. I mean, we kind of got a choice there. But what we choose to do with our time, God's still giving us breath. Like I said, Sister Lou's Sister Lou's time's over. And she made a great impact while she was here. Thank God for those of us, those of you that knew her, you felt that, you've seen that. Uh, but our time's still here, Brother Mike. Yeah. I don't know how much time we've got, but we ought to make the best <clears throat> use of whatever time we've got right. that is left, right? Mm -hmm. It's still our time to make our mark. You've got your time to make your mark. And I don't think any of us that have the right reason in mind are trying to make a name for yourself, uh, but it sure like to make uh, the Lord's name known. I'd sure like to bring honor and glory to Jesus, Brother Jim. I'd sure like to see lost souls get saved and, and save people drawn closer to the Lord, yeah. Brother Mike. I'd like to see that. Amen. I'd like to see myself drawn closer to the Lord yes. and do more for his glory. So we, we've got time to do that, and uh, and we ought to use it, right? We ought to use it for his glory. You got th some other things you got behind you in this time. You know, most of the time, unless you've adopted kids or have kids really late in life, most of the kids are at least grown. You're not carrying them around, giving them bottles, changing diapers anymore. Uh, Sam's not the fresh Baba man anymore back there in the corner. <laughs> you know, he can, he can kind of go in and fix his own sandwich now if he wants to, you know. And, and so it's given me a little more free time. Well, how am I going to spend that free time? Well, we live in a world of technology, Chris. I can spend it all in front of Netflix if I want to, you know. And uh, But I'm not going to profit anything by watching the last episode of whatever, you know. Uh, and I, I like watching TV some. That's a good way to unwind. But I don't want to spend too much time there for the day. And uh, I, could, I mean, it wouldn't hurt me not to spend any time there, Brother Mike. And uh, I would mean, be careful how we, how we spend our days and how we spend our time. You know, I was thinking about Daniel uh, in the scriptures and, and some habits that he had. And, and we all know about the prayer life of, of Daniel. And, uh, you know, he encountered some of the same things as I was reflecting a little bit on his life uh, that you and I go through, you know. And, and uh, he, there were some things that were, uh, that were similar in, in his life uh, that, that are similar in ours. You ever fought a battle to think, man, finally that's over, thank God, to have to go back and fight it all over again, you know? Uh, Daniel was under the, the reign of three different kings just in the passage of Scripture that we'll be talking about this morning. And Brother Mike, just after he got one kind of under control, another one would rise up that didn't know anything about God, and he had to start all over again. Right. It, it's kind of like that with us. You know, anytime I've started a job, any testimony that you have on your job, when you start a new one, Brother Gary, you're starting all over again. Mm -hmm. Most people don't know anything about you. And uh, I had a fellow, I remember when I started this one, uh, walk up to me, because I was trying to be good to people, trying to treat them right, you know, and, and most people, if you've ever been in a factory, they come in disgusted, they leave disgusted, they cuss all day long while they're there, you know. They don't, it's not the most pleasant place to be like a lot of places are. I'm not saying it's the worst place to work in the world, but it's not the best either. And uh, I had some guy pull me aside one day, not long after I'd started. I think I'd been there about two or three months. He said, I gotta ask you a question. He's my trainer. And uh, I didn't know what to expect. And I was like, okay, well, yeah, what, what's up? He said, are you the biggest butt kisser in the world? Or what's your deal? I don't understand. You know, what's just from being nice to people, he thought I was a butt kisser. That's what he called it right here. And uh, I, I didn't even know how to respond to that. You know, I think I just sat there with my, my mouth open for a little while. And I said, no, I'm just trying to learn, you know, trying to get to know people. I mean, just trying to. But he had never, he said, found out later this man's an atheist. Doesn't know God. 
And uh, he was one of the more bitter people that I've been around, you know. And, and I hope over time, uh, things have changed. Our relationship has definitely changed. It, it isn't the same as it was when I started there, Brother Mike. It's good. And, uh, but, you know, over time, people get to see who you are, and hopefully they can see the God that's in you, but it does not happen overnight. You don't go tell somebody I'm a Christian and immediately they reform the way they treat you or the way they act around you. It, it takes time. you got to be willing to go through that time to let that develop. Because you got to prove yourself to people over time. I and mean, think about how many people have failed you. You know, they look one way in the beginning, and then after you're around them a little while, you see their true colors, and you're like, man, that's not at all who I thought it was. Well, they've been through the same thing, right? So they got it takes time for them to see that you're genuine and, and even that the God that you serve is real. Yeah. And Daniel, Daniel had been through that, man. He'd been through Nebuchadnezzar, who was lifted up with pride, the Bible tells us about. And uh, the Lord came along and gave Nebuchadnezzar a, a dream that he couldn't interpret. And Daniel interpreted that dream and said, you're going to be driven out, Nebuchadnezzar. You're going to be driven from your kingdom. You're going to go out into the field. You're going to eat grass like an ox. You're going to grow feathers. I mean, everything that he said came to pass. And God turned him basically into a wild beast for a certain period of time. He went out, and the Bible said the dew of heaven fell upon him. I mean, he lived like an animal, ate grass like an ox, grew claws like a, like a bird. And uh, boy, because he was lifted up with pride, he thought that this kingdom's mine, this world's mine, all this that, that God had given him, uh, he thought was his, and he'd done it. It was the strength of his arm, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, God showed him very quickly that that wasn't the case. And man, when he got done with him, Nebuchadnezzar was more than willing to give praise to God, right, for who he yeah. was and what he could do and, and that the kingdom wasn't his. Well, not long after that happened, so uh, Daniel had to, had to go through a, a great ordeal with him. Then, then comes along Belshazzar, his son, who evidently had forgotten what God had done for his dad. He knew about it. It had been made known to him. I mean, you this thing that happened with Nebuchadnezzar, I mean, you ever heard of somebody growing feathers and claws and going out and eating grass like an ox? I mean, everybody knew about this, including the son. Yeah. Well, the Bible said that one day he made a, a great feast to a thousand of his lords, the people that he had over the kingdom, the, the rulers. And while he tasted the wine, the Bible says, that during this feast, while he tasted the wine, uh, he commanded that the vessels of the Lord be brought that Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple in Jerusalem when they took over Jerusalem. Because at this time, the Jewish people were being held captive. They'd been taken over by another country because of their disobedience. It was Babylon. And God sometimes will strengthen a nation, even a nation that doesn't know God, to bring judgment on a nation that does know God just to punish them and to get them back on track for him. And that's exactly what was going on here. And so Nebuchadnezzar, again, had, had gone through all this display of pride. Daniel had uh, given him the vision of what was going to happen. It happened, and, and Nebuchadnezzar had raised Daniel and made him set, set him up as a ruler over the nation, giving him great power. And Belshazzar came along and kind of forgot all about that. Well, anyway, he's having this great feast. He brings these vessels from the Lord, and I'm talking about like the the chalices and the pitchers and the stuff I'm talking about from the temple that were used to worship God with. Right. And, uh, and they began to drink wine, his rulers, he and his rulers and his uh, concubines and his wives, all out of these vessels that belonged in the house of the Lord. And boy, about the time they said, said in the same hour that they started drinking out of those vessels, there was a hand that appeared and wrote on the wall that message that we've all heard about so far, you know, so long. And, and uh, again, Belshazzar said his, his, his knees smoked together. I mean, he was scared to death. He sees this hand. Well, imagine if you're that person, man. I mean, you see a hand appear out of nowhere and start writing a message on the wall. He brought in all of his, uh, all of his soothsayers and all of his magicians and all the people in the land that were going to come in and interpret uh, that vision. And none of them knew, Brother Mike. They didn't know what that, that vision meant. They didn't know what any of that stood for. And um, so the Bible says that uh, they brought in Daniel. Everybody knew about Daniel. They knew that there was this man in the land that could interpret these dreams and interpret these visions. 
and uh, they brought him in to interpret what was going on. And, and uh, Daniel told him that the kingdom was going to be taken from him. He said, it's going to be divided. Uh, you've been weighed in the balances and found wanting. And he said, uh, you know, your, your kingdom is going to be stripped from you. And, and that very night, the Bible said, uh, Belshazzar was slain and the Medes and the Persians came in and took over the land. Well, then comes King Darius. Now we got the third king. So we got Nebuchadnezzar, his son Belshazzar, and now we have King Darius, the king of the Medes and the Persians. And uh, Daniel's habit was, we're talking about habits, Daniel's habit was to pray to the Lord three times a day. He'd open his windows toward Jerusalem in the night, and he prayed three times a day with his windows toward Jerusalem. And uh, as he prayed toward Jerusalem, uh, the, the men, the leaders of the land, began to hear Daniel praying. They couldn't find fault with him. Um, Belshazzar, uh, after he passed away and Darius had witnessed all this, he had set Daniel up to be one of the leaders of the land. He was a leader of leaders. They all had to come to him. They didn't like that, Brother David. They didn't like the fact that they had to come to, they had to, come to Daniel. So they tried to find fault with him. The only thing they could find fault in is, is the way he worshiped God. So they made that decree uh, that you wouldn't worship any other God in the land. Um, you know, so that, that's what they set up as a decree. They made the king sign that. They influenced him to sign a decree saying that there was nobody to be able to pray to any other God. And um, sure enough, Daniel, the Bible said when he knew that the decree had been signed, he opened up his windows toward Jerusalem and prayed, right? He wasn't fearful. He knew that God was his God. It was his habit. It was his, uh, it was his determination to pray to the God of heaven. And he opened up his windows toward Jerusalem and prayed three times a day, just like he did before. Well, because of that, uh, because he, the king had made that decree, he had to honor the decree of the Medes and the Persians. And uh, Daniel, uh, once again, uh, was put in a, in a strait betwixt two. You know, he, he decided he'd serve God rather than the world or rather than the king's decree. And he was put in the den of lions, the Bible said. And uh, the king had already had a love for him. He already he, he had seen that God's hand was upon him, but because of this decree that he'd been influenced to write, uh, he had to he had to do he had to honor the decree. So we all know the story there. God saved Daniel alive. He was able to come out of the lion's den. Those that accused him were put in the lion's den or were torn asunder immediately. And uh, Belshazzar. Uh, Belshazzar, who he had served formerly, was now replaced by Darius, and Darius promoted him again in the kingdom. Uh, and he was, again, made a ruler of rulers, and the whole nation was, was made to honor the Lord because of what had happened, because they knew that there was no other God like this God that Daniel served. But it took time, Brother Jim. It didn't happen overnight. He first had to serve under Nebuchadnezzar, then he had to serve under Belshazzar, now he's serving under Darius with Mike, and he had to fight some of the same battles over and over again. I said all that to say this. You and I sometimes are going to have to fight some of the same battles over and over again, right? And uh, the, you're going to have to prove your testimony to people more than once in your lifetime. It isn't something you just go out and witness to somebody or try to be in a good example one day uh, and then never have to do it again, Brother Mike. Uh, we're we're going to have to prove our testimony and prove who we are, uh, sometimes as Christians, over and over again throughout our lifetime, but to different groups of people. And thank God that he does that. How are we going to reach a lost world if, we, if we're not doing that each and every day, right? I mean, that's something we're supposed to be reaching people all the time. And I firmly believe God had Daniel in that position just to reach that kingdom and to reach those people. And for such a time as this, right? And God's got you where he has you for such a time as this. Sometimes we think our moves around, the places God moves us, the, the changes that are made in our life and our circumstances and the people around us, uh, sometimes God makes those changes because he wants a light in that place, right? He wants a testimony there. He wants somebody to be able to see God in that place. And you might be the one that, that God has used in that, that particular place. Um, Proverbs chapter number 18 and verse number 16, 
the Bible says a man's gift maketh room for him and bringeth him before great men. That's exactly what happened with Daniel. His particular gift in this way was to interpret dreams, right? Mm -hmm. His gift was to interpret dreams and visions, <coughs> and that had brought him in his lifetime before three different kings. He was used of God. And also his prayer life, his habit of prayer, but again, made him stand before kings. He influenced rulers of nations because of the gift that, that God gave him. A man's gift maketh room for him and bringeth him before great men. And then in Proverbs 12, verse number 24, the hand of the diligent shall bear a rule, but the slothful shall be under tribute. He said the hand of the diligent. That word diligent means constant in effort or steadily applied. Constant in effort, steadily applied. And uh, that, that's how he was. he was. He was diligent. He was constant in his prayer life. He was steadily applied to that thing that God had left him to do. He'd been given a gift, and he chose to be diligent with the use of his gift. He used it every day. He was faithful three times a day to do what God had asked him to do, and that God placed on his heart. And then God did what he always does. God, honors, God honored his word, right? He promoted him in the kingdom. He had to set him before a great man because the Bible says it, that he would, right? His, his gift made room for him and brought him before great men. And God was fulfilling his word, which he always does. And um, so in, in our lives, God's going to bring us sometimes before uh, people in the same way. It might be the leadership in the company that you work for. It, it might be the mayor in the town that you live. It might be the governor of the state that you live. Some of you might stand before a president someday and do something for God. It would be wonderful if you could, if you could be used of God that way. I just heard of a man a couple weeks ago that, that had uh, been responsible for <coughs> counseling with several presidents in his lifetime to give them advice in times of war and times when they were confused and didn't know what to do, but might. And God can use us to do that if we'll be faithful, if we'll just be a spokesman for the Lord. Not get weary in well-doing, like the Bible says. Not, not to be weary in well-doing. For in due season, the Bible says, we shall reap if we faint not. In due season. Again, you might have to have some seasons go by for that to happen. Right? Oh, yeah. Might not be right after you do it, Brother Mike. It might take a little while. Uh, but God's going to do his work. Yes, sir. And... Um, if you all would, if you turn over in your Bibles to uh, Daniel chapter number five, I just want to read through some of that, some of that uh, reference, some of that story that we were talking about here. Daniel chapter number five. Uh, while you're turning there, I'm going to turn to another passage of scripture. Daniel chapter number five. Verse number one, when you get there, Daniel chapter number five, verse number one. The Bible says, Belshazzar the king made a great feast to a thousand of his lords and drank wine before the thousand. Belshazzar, while he tasted the wine, commanded to bring the golden and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple which was in Jerusalem, that the king and his princes, his wives, and his concubines might drink therein. Then they brought the golden vessels that were taken out of the temple of the house of God which was at Jerusalem. You know, Brother John, this reminds me of like the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant. Remember there as it remained in that man's house, everything was fine, his family was blessed. But when the wrong people started to handle the things of the Lord, Brother Mike, bad, there were people that died because of that. Well, this was somebody else that died because they were handling the things of the Lord. It's dangerous, it really sure. is. I wouldn't want to go into a New Testament church and touch anything. I mean, I really would. I mean, people that could come in a church house. Remember, a preacher talked about one time somebody told, uh, stole our church sign out front that had Good Shepherd on it and an arrow, I think, or just said uh, Good Shepherd Baptist Church. I'm not sure what it said. But the church began to pray about that sign that somebody stole. 
And he said he came back, I don't know how many days it was later, I wasn't here during that time. He could tell you the whole story. <clears throat> they came back one day and the sign, the post, and the bolts were all laying in the entrance out there. Somebody had brought it back. God knows what happened to them in the meantime, but I bet it wasn't good, right? Yeah. God didn't, he didn't take lightly people uh, taking lightly the things that are in his house and things that are used for his honor and his glory. He hadn't changed all that, right? No, sir. <clears throat> That's still today. Um, so they taken these vessels out of the house of the Lord, verse number three. Then they brought the golden vessels that were taken out of the temple of the house of God, which was at Jerusalem. And the king and his princes, his wives and his concubines drank in them. They drank wine, and look at this. Now, here's a really dangerous part. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and of silver and of brass and of iron, of wood and of stone. So they made all these graven, these false gods out of these different metals and stone and wood and iron, and they began to worship and praise those gods, drinking out of the vessels that used to be in God's house. And uh, man, what a dangerous thing. Almost gives me cold chills just thinking about seeing them do that. But that's what they did. And in the same hour, verse number five, came forth fingers of a man's hand and wrote over against the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. The king's countenance was changed. His thoughts troubled him so that the joints of his loins were loosed and his knees smote one against the other. And the king cried aloud to bring the astrologers and the Chaldeans and the soothsayers. And the king spake, spake <clears throat> excuse me, and said unto the wise men of Babylon, Whosoever shall read this writing and show me the interpretation thereof shall be clothed with scarlet and have a chain of gold about his neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. That's exactly what happened with Daniel. He was the one that came in and made the interpretation because the magicians and the soothsayers and all those that worship the devil couldn't do it, uh, but David could, and he was made the third ruler in the kingdom. And that's what happened. That was the story behind what happened when Belshazzar came along in the next chapter. Those of you have time when you get home, we're not going to have time to go through it today. But if you want to read about that, <clears throat> in chapter number six, it talks about how it starts off in Belshazzar's kingdom uh, Daniel had already been promoted to the third ruler of the kingdom. Uh, Darius, come, Belshazzar dies uh, after this passage of scripture here that we're reading. Um, Darius comes on the scene as king of the Medes and the Persians. Remember God said the, king, the kingdom would be taken from Belshazzar. It was. It was given to Darius. And uh, so David, Daniel has been set up as the third ruler of the kingdom. And now uh, jealousy comes about. Jealousy comes about by the other rulers because of where Daniel's been set up in the kingdom. And and you folks, as you live your lives for the Lord, you've already encountered this. If you live for God at all, there are going to be some people jealous of you. Jealous of where God's placed you. Jealous of what God's done for you, of how God's using you. Uh, you you'll encounter jealousy and people will try to bring you down, Brother Mike. They will. They'll try to bring you down. And, uh, but thank God if you be faithful to the Lord, develop some good habits like, like Daniel did. Continue to pray to God no matter the circumstances, no matter what's said about you, no matter what uh, anybody tries to do. I mean, these, these people, they were, and it's why they're written about in the scriptures. Brother Gary, they weren't just persecuted. I mean, it meant their life. I mean, can you imagine being told you're going to be thrown in a den of lions or a Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were? Uh, thrown in a fiery furnace if you serve God. How many of you have been through anything like that? I haven't been through. I mean, all the worst I've had somebody talk about me maybe or make fun of me, but I've never been faced with something like that. I mean, these men, it was their lives that were on the line, and they determined they were going to serve God no matter what. What I was going to tell you about when we started uh, talking about this, uh, talking about habits, I just thought it was part of the born-again experience, Brother, Brother John, that I'd want to come to the house of God. And it is. That's a lot of it. Uh, but when I, when, I, when I was faced with not being able to come to church, I, I don't get to come two weekends a month. I get to come to Sunday night service one of those weekends. Uh, but there's two morning services that I don't get to come to. I can't, Brother David, because I'm going to work. It's not my choice. I, I want to be here. I promise you from the bottom of my heart. Uh, but I, I, I've told you all this before. 
but I was surprised how quickly I got adjusted to not being at church two weekends a month. And that shocked me, Brother John, because I thought, wait a minute, I'm, I'm a Christian here. I wanted to be here still, but I got adjusted to it a lot faster than I thought I would. I hated it the first week or two, Brother Mike, but what, it, what God did with that, Brother Paul, is show me how people get out of church. I noticed how they get out. Because oh, yeah. I'd always been here. You know, been here about every time the doors were open, you know. But boy, after you, and that's how it happens, you know. And, and they get out maybe for different reasons, maybe because they're disillusioned with somebody. I don't know what just happened with Brother Gary up here, folks. I don't know. But y'all y'all pray for Gary, okay? Amen. He's got, we need to pray for him. Right? He needs, we, we all need prayer, yeah. right? And, uh, and he sometimes people get things in their mind that you can't cry out with a pitchfork. He, he may have thought I said something this morning that was directed to him. As God is my witness, I, I did not. But he may have thought I did. He thought preacher said some things a little while back that he didn't say. So he's got some things going on. He needs us to pray for him. Okay? He needs us to support him. And we can only do what he'll let us do, but let's, let's pray for him. Okay? Let's just bond together as a church to do that. Uh, but anyway, um, I thought, again, it was all just being born again that I wanted to come to church, but I thought, man, I accepted that a whole lot easier than I thought I would, Jim, not being able to be there. Mm -hmm. And people get disillusioned sometimes. They leave, and boy, you miss a Wednesday night. And uh, at first you think, man, it feels weird not being in the house of God. It's Wednesday mm -hmm. night. Everybody else is there. But after two or three Wednesdays, Chris, it's not such a big deal anymore. You start to develop new habits, right? You're forging new pathways in your mind, right? Developing a different habit. Man, after about 66 days of that, Wednesday night's no big deal anymore. You know, then, then it usually comes back to, well, Sunday night. You know, God said we're supposed to worship him on Sunday. That's the Lord's day. I mean, really, Wednesday night's just extra. I mean, I, we don't really need to be there for Wednesday night. Why are we even going... And, I mean, he said to worship him on Sunday, but he didn't say how many times. I mean, you know, we just, I think once is enough. I mean, good grief. You're already developing these new habits, right? The world's starting to pull you away. Before you know it, Wednesday night's gone. You know, after a few of those, you've already developed that habit now. And then comes Sunday. That's usually the last one to go Sunday morning. Once that one's gone, you're out of church, really. Here. It's gone, you know. And I firmly believe there are probably, haven't experienced, I'm telling you what I've experienced, and some of you haven't, maybe you can't imagine that, maybe your mind can't go there, that's okay, maybe I'm wrong, I might be. But I, I fully believe that there are probably saved people out there that have gotten themselves out of the house of God, and they've become people that don't even look like Christians anymore. Their habits have gotten them going so much in another direction. And uh, I, I believe they're, they're out there, and, and, and folks, we need to talk to them. I talk to people that are disillusioned with church all the time, some bad experience they've had. I really believe people like Southeast Christian are probably full of people that have been disillusioned someplace else. They just go there so they can hide, and a big number of people don't have to know anybody. Nobody knows when they're there. They don't know when they're not there. They can just come and go, and they can leave, and nobody... Nothing's required of them. I'm glad, Brother David, when I'm not here, somebody in this church is going to be asking, Brother, where were you last week? I'm, I'm glad that there's some accountability, yes, Chris. I need that. Because there's times when my flesh doesn't feel like being here. I'm, I'm glad my preacher lives right down my street. He passes my house. You think he ain't going to be in my driveway after three or four times of missing church? He's going to be in my driveway here. And I know that. Mm -hmm. And the days that I feel the least like being here, that's sometimes what can compel my honorary hind end to get up and go to the house of God. Mm -hmm. Like when I don't feel like coming, because somebody here is going to be asking where I'm at. I'm glad for that. Yes, sir. And I'm telling you, don't take that for granted that you're in a small church of people that care about you and they'll want to see you do the right thing and, and uh, habits. We, we, need, we need good habits. We do. And, uh, and coming to the house of God is a fantastic habit. You all have already, I'm talking to the choir. You all are here every week. Don't get out of bad habits all right? or good habits. Don't, don't, don't form bad habits. Don't, don't let those good habits that you have go a different direction because they can carry you that way if you let them. But let's, by the grace and help of God, let God help us develop good habits to do more for him. Maybe you don't read your Bible like you ought to. Try doing that for 66 days and beyond. 
just let God form a new habit in you that every morning when you wake up, it feels odd if you haven't spent some time in here. Oh man, I didn't read my Bible this morning. I got to get along and spend some time with God. If you don't pray like you ought to, let God develop that habit in you. I mean, do pray and pray consistently until it feels odd that you haven't prayed. If, if you're not the kind of witness that God would have you to be and you've got the ability to get out and witness and talk to people about the Lord, go out and do that for a while. Be faithful doing it until it feels odd that you don't. I was talking about Freddie Spry earlier. I've never seen a man in my life, Chris, going to testify to this. He's been out on a mission trip with us. There isn't hardly a man that, or a woman or a young person that passes by that man that doesn't get a gospel track. Well, those little smiley faces. Uh, that Jesus loves you, Brother Mike. I don't know how many thousands of those things he's given out, but I can tell you in Conyers, Georgia, in any place he goes on a mission revival, there are people everywhere that get those things. I mean, all over the place because it's become a habit. That's good. He told me when he's walking past people, if he passes by somebody and doesn't give him one, God's on him. Like, you need to give him a track. You need to go back and give him a track because he's developed that habit. And you and I can develop those kind of habits, too, that serve God uh, just as well as people develop bad habits to serve the Lord. You can develop habits of drinking, of all kinds of bad things, uh, but we can develop good ones, too, with the help of the Lord. So uh, with God's help, we'll do that. Father, thank you, dear Lord, for this day.